Ben Frith, thank you very much for setting the scene, highlighting the stark challenges the sport faces the world over. So it is time for our first session of the day, and it is on the importance of integrity and the need for robust systems to support it. The session will begin with introductory remarks by the Federation's Executive Director, Andrew Harding, and he'll set a strong foundation for the business program. Uh, Justice Frank Clark, Director of the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board and former Chief Justice of Ireland, will then deliver a keynote speech regarding the importance of integrity in sport and the need for robust systems to protect that integrity and protect the sport against legal challenges. But first of all, please welcome Andrew Harding. Thank you, Rishi, and good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. So, with today's conference focusing on racing integrity, I thought it'd be useful to commence by stepping back and asking the threshold question. What is integrity? One definition is that it is the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. I think that's a very useful definition. If we set it our mission to operate with honesty and if we have strong moral principles that underpin our structures, our policies, our decision making, then I believe we can achieve integrity in racing. And moreover, if the public perception is that this is a sport that has the quality of being honest and is one that has strong moral principles, then as racing administrators and regulators, we will have succeeded. Trying to particularise this, I believe that achieving integrity in racing means pursuing four objectives. The first is ensuring a level playing field for all participants. The second is ensuring the safety and welfare of all participants. The third is ensuring that race results are not skewed by the use of prohibited substances or by other illicit advantage. And finally, ensuring impartial and fair investigation and adjudication of disciplinary matters. Why is it important that we do this? The obvious answer is that operating with integrity is the cornerstone of any successful and sustainable sport. However, in the case of racing, we recognise that we are held to a higher standard. We start with the presumption that exists in the minds of at least some quarters of the community that we have not and do not always operate with integrity. And sensational cases of dishonesty and immorality while the exception, still occur often enough to reinforce this perception. Now, there's an irony here because these cases are brought to light because of the sophistication of our integrity systems, and yet there is always some collateral damage to our reputation when they are prosecuted. Another relevant factor is that we are unique as a sport because we rely on betting as our major source of funding, at least in most countries. This betting depends on public confidence in our integrity. And beyond this, we will not be successful in meeting other threats to sustainability unless we achieve what is necessary in relation to integrity. It's against this backdrop that I have the great pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Justice Frank Clark, who will discuss the importance of integrity in sport and the need for robust systems to protect it. And um, without any measure of exaggeration, it would be difficult to conceive of anyone who is better qualified than Justice Frank Clark to do this. A former Chief Justice of Ireland and among, among many other current roles, a director of the Irish Horse Racing Regulatory Board, Frank's professional life has been dedicated to upholding integrity in various forms. Could you please join me therefore in welcoming Justice Frank Clark. <laughs> 
morning, everybody, and can I first say it's a great pleasure and a great honor to be asked to address this important meeting. Uh, I was warned in advance that I should not speak um, at the speed with which Irish people normally speak because that might prove a difficulty for the interpreters. So I'm hoping to adopt a pace more appropriate to the Prix du Cadran rather than the Prix de la Baie. Um, I sometimes think when one is looking for principles that an interesting way of considering them is to put a knot into the sentence and see does it still make sense. And if we started with saying racing is not in favour of integrity, uh, integrity is not important to racing, we would see how ludicrous those propositions would be. So why are we here at all? We know the answer. However, I think it is important to analyse why we need a high level of integrity in racing, to assess its importance, and also to address the question of how we minimise the public risks that have already been mentioned. Um, <clears throat> I, I suppose one must start uh, with the fact that we do depend on public support in a whole range of different ways. Some have already been mentioned by the chair and uh, the, the executive. Um, essentially, I would see and would argue that integrity, while not perhaps as central to the question of social license or social acceptability, still forms a very important part of that. If there is a view that racing significantly lacks integrity, then that must affect the public appreciation of racing. And the range of consequences that flow from that are, in my view, very wide, some already touched on. Um, for example, we are all, to a greater or lesser extent, dependent on the view government takes of us. In some cases, it is a significant funding feature, whether the conferring of a monopoly on betting, which is used to fund racing, or levies on racing or grants from government. And at a more extreme level, as we've seen from some of the slides uh, which we have looked at earlier, uh, m measures adopted to, for example, control gambling can in itself affect racing. And at the very extreme, there can be moves from some uh, quarters to suggest that racing should be significantly curtailed or even abandoned. So maintaining an appropriate relationship with government seems to me to be vital to the continuance of the sport. But government doesn't operate in isolation. Uh, government is affected by its perception, at least, of what the public generally think. And while it's true in the context, for example, of animal welfare, that you perhaps can identify three groups. There are those who don't think sport with animals is acceptable at all, and they will never be convinced. You have, frankly, people within the racing bubble who think it's all a load of rubbish and we needn't worry about it at all. But there's a large centre ground, some of whom may be, to a greater or lesser extent, interested in racing, some of whom may have no involvement in racing at all. But if that large centre ground is lost to racing and moves to a position closer to those who think racing has no place in our society, then it would be very surprising if government did not move some of the way in that direction. So I think the key question is we need to maintain the support of the general middle ground of persons, some of whom are not racing people, many of whom are not racing people, but who, whose views will ultimately influence the direction that things go in. And in that sense, it seems to me, perhaps the key question, a bit like the analogy in the courts of justice not only being done, but being seen to be done, we need racing in which integrity is given a high value, but is also seen to be given a high value, because without that, that central public support will be lost. Um, can I suggest, one, could, one can always define things in very many different ways, but can I suggest that there are perhaps three pillars at a very high level upon which an effective integrity system is based and one which is capable by and large of withstanding what was, I think, correctly identified as one of the challenges, which is the fact that well-resourced parties may choose to go to the general courts of the relevant jurisdiction to challenge decisions made by racing authorities. The first, and perhaps the most obvious, is that our rules need to make sense. 
um, rules which can become outdated, which don't keep pace with modern developments, can prove a fertile ground for clever and expensive lawyers uh, to find ways of diverting uh, cases away from perhaps the true issue into peripheral or technical issues which can cause problems. I'll come back to that issue in a moment. Second, we need processes which are designed to ensure that those rules are put into effect reasonably effectively. It's entirely possible to envisage a most perfectly formed rule book which doesn't work in practice because the processes are not there to make sure that it works in practice. And thirdly, and perhaps of particular importance to a gathering such as this, there is a need to ensure the independence of those who are charged with regulating. There are powerful interests, as uh, the, the chair rightly pointed out. The scale of prize money uh, is increasing. There are those who make a very good living out of that scale of prize money. There are great breeding in interests. And therefore, there's always a risk of pressure being placed upon regulators uh, to produce results that are less unfavorable uh, to powerful vested interests. So we need to protect the independence of the regulators to ensure that if we have good rules, good processes to put those rules into effect, and independent uh, persons uh, enforcing those rules, then there will be the public perception that racing has a high level of integrity. I, I suppose we also need to put out the story that no system is ever perfect. There will always be some failings. Um, even a well-respected criminal justice system in any of our jurisdictions will lead to a situation where some murders go unsolved, where some people are not caught drunk driving, or where fraud is not detected. But that doesn't mean of itself that the system is not regarded as broadly functioning. Uh, so we have to accept things will inevitably happen that we would prefer do not happen. That's not, can I suggest, the test. And I agree we are probably held to a higher standard than perhaps many other areas, and we perhaps have to accept that. But what we cannot do is give the impression that we don't care, that we are not trying, and more importantly, that we do not have in place rules, processes, and individuals that, that are able to deliver at a very high level in ensuring integrity. Now, if I might go back to what I suggest are the three pillars that we need to explore. Um, rules are important. Um, keeping rules up to date, I think, is hugely important. And I very much welcome the handbook that is being launched today uh, as an aid to all of our uh, constituent parts to um, ensure that our rules are fit for purpose. It's very interesting, in, in Ireland, we are currently engaged in a project to entirely review our rule book. And uh, it was striking to me as, uh, as one of those who's involved in that project to realize just how many rules we had that were outdated, that reflected different ways of doing things, which had not been amended when the world changed to some extent. Uh, and as someone who might like to think of himself as a clever lawyer, a clever lawyer will be very good at finding some rule which we all say, well, we never apply that. But you say, it's in your rule book, it's there, you must comply with it. And if the stakes are high, then that's the kind of loophole in the rules that would be looked for. So I think uh, updating rules on a regular basis is an important uh, aspect of the development of integrity, but also, can I suggest, sharing experience. Um, obviously, sometimes one finds out a problem with the rules after an embarrassing case occurs and a loophole is discovered which allows some, uh, somebody to go free, as it were, who should not go free. But it would be much better if we had discovered that loophole before the embarrassing case. And the fact that perhaps a similar problem arose in another jurisdiction is one way in which it may be easy to identify. Well, actually, our rule looks just the same as the rule in name of other country where they got into trouble because that rule didn't work very well. Um, I suppose as, as someone who has an interest in a number of sports, 
uh, but most particularly racing. Uh, I'm always struck by the fact that the rules in other sports tend to be the same no matter where the game is played. Uh, one wouldn't expect the offside rule in football to be different if the match is played in, in uh, Paris or if it's been played in Sydney. And the fact that the rules of racing are formulated by a myriad of different bodies across a myriad of different jurisdictions it was always an interesting side effect uh, of the racing regulatory regime. But at least we can learn from what happens in other jurisdictions and identify rules which are not working well. And can I also suggest that one perhaps overriding matter would be usefully considered, and that is a regular overall review of the rule book. Um, it's something I actually started saying in the context of the rules of the Irish courts some years ago. Uh, and it's something that I think happens in a lot of rule books. Um, a problem is identified, a fix, a plaster is placed over it. Rule 217 hasn't worked too well, so we need to change it. Some new problem has emerged, we need a new rule to deal with it. And all that's very sensible, and some often those patches do work. But sometimes at the end of the day, what you're faced with is a very unwieldy and not overly logical set of rules. I once described it as being a bit like a house that's perfectly well designed at the beginning, but then we need an extra couple of bedrooms because there's more children and we build them over there. And nowadays we don't like lots of small rooms, we like open plans, we knock down a few walls. And after about 40 years of those old small changes, each one of which made sense in its own way, we have a rather unwieldy building. And I think rule books sometimes look like that when they haven't been reviewed. So can I suggest in the context of rules, firstly, the greatest level of international information to identify rules that do work, but equally importantly, rules that have not worked as well as, they, as it might seem. And secondly, a regular review to ensure that the necessary individual patches don't create a patchwork which doesn't work. Um, processes is then the, the, the next part of the equation, the next pillar. Um, as I say, it's possible to have a perfectly pristine rule book that just doesn't work. Uh, and we need to have uh, in place systems that allow information to be obtained that can bring integrity issues to the appropriate deciding body for its determination. Um, one of the interesting developments in the Irish context in uh, recent times was the presentation of an integrity case based on a collection of individual uh, races involving an individual trainer. I I'd always believed that it was possible uh, for us to bring cases which were based on a series of incidents no one of which might be capable of bringing you over the threshold of establishing wrongdoing, but which cumulatively might be taken to do so. Um, this happens in the ordinary courts on a regular basis. The evidence that may lead to a very serious conviction, such as murder, may involve four elements, no one of which would be enough to establish guilt, but when you put them together, the chances of them all being capable of an innocent explanation disappear. But clearly an, an important element of some of the presentation of those type of cases is betting patterns. Um, and I very much echo the comments that have been made about the danger that access to up-to-date and appropriate information about betting patterns may be significantly impaired by the growth of illegal, uh, illegal betting markets from which that information will not emerge. But we can readily understand that it's much easier to make a case saying there was suspicious running in these four races and funnily enough the horses were not backed and then there was interesting winning performances in these other four races and very funnily the horse was backed in each of those. That presents a much more compelling case but we need the process that allows us to present that evidence and that in turn particularly emphasizes the need to, to get the information to allow that evidence to be presented. And of course, in the very important area of uh, doping, uh, we need processes that are sustainable for establishing the results of, of uh, doping tests uh, and the ability to present evidence. And I know there will be a uh, discussion of this later on during the day. Um, and of course, these are constantly evolving areas
Uh, it's a constant battle between, in many areas, between those who seek to prevent and those who seek to exploit. And we need to be constantly vigilant, and the rules need to be kept up to date. Um, we, you know, rules that worked 10 years ago may not work in the current context because you may need to present uh, evidence that your rule books uh, call into question. And then finally, there is the, the issue of the personnel, as it were, and the independence of the personnel, both those who are involved in the investigation and those who are involved in decision making as a result of the investigation. Um, obviously, it is difficult to avoid the possibility that there will be pressure placed on individuals. And perhaps there is, again, uh, in the context of this body, there is strength in numbers, where you have colleague organizations in other jurisdictions who can give you support if there is an impression or the possibility of, of inappropriate external pressure being applied, then the support of colleagues doing the same job in other jurisdictions seems to me uh, to be vital. If you put all those together, if you have up-to-date rules, if you have appropriate processes, and if you have people applying those processes, whether in investigation or in uh, decision-making, uh, that are independent, then I think you have a very good base for an effective integrity system, but more importantly, one which will be recognized as such in the outside world. Uh, and we may perhaps need to do more to sell that to the outside world um, in a very different context, the context of uh, our own courts. In the first public speech I made as Chief Justice, I, I coined a phrase which was, you can't complain if you don't explain. Sometimes what we are given out in many areas of life what we suffer from are complaints, some of which may be justified and may have identified failings on our part that we need to deal with, uh, some of which are totally unfair, but some of which may be not correct, but it may be as much our fault that those complaints are made publicly because we haven't been good at selling what we're doing to the public who consider there to be a problem even where there isn't. And I think that perhaps moral applies equally to racing uh, as it does uh, in many other areas of life. Uh, I, I think the creation of the handbook which has been launched today uh, is a very important uh, contribution to many aspects of those pillars which I've identified. Uh, and ultimately, I suppose, the added value I can bring to this topic is as someone who has also been a judge uh, who has sat on a high uh, national court um, unfortunately, I was never able to sit on any cases involving racing because I was always conflicted, but it didn't prevent me having the odd discussion with the judges who were uh, dealing with those cases to explain the, the meaning of life to them. Um, but one of the things we have to recognize is if a case goes to a general court, it will not be heard by people who have necessarily any particular interest uh, or knowledge of uh, the sport they're dealing with. Uh, so our Processes, our rules, need to be intelligible to an expert who is not an expert in racing, but is an expert in, in the law. Uh, and not having those processes in a way that are understandable and understandable as being fair leads to the risk that the non-expert racing, uh, non-racing expert judge may come to a conclusion that we don't think is right but which would be very hard to dispute. So I think perhaps the overuse of jargon in rules is something that needs to be considered for removal. Um, jargon which everyone in racing understands, but no one outside racing understands, can be apt to mislead the non-racing person. I think that's true not just about legal challenges, but perhaps selling racing, if I may say so, to a wider public. Uh, you can often see discussions, not when Rishi is on the television, but when other presenters are there, where jargon is used, which everyone who knows about racing understands, but no one else has a clue what they're talking about, though I think things have improved a lot lately. But I think from a legal perspective, that's also true. Uh, you know, if there isn't a definition in the rules that makes sense to the non-racing person, then there is a risk that if that case goes before the courts, uh, there will be a problem. Um, it's also, I suppose, the starting point of 
court challenges is to recognize that just as racing operates in many different jurisdictions with different rules, we deal with very different legal systems. There may be legal cultural issues or even racing cultural issues about whether people bring cases in certain jurisdictions and not in others. But it does seem to be an increasing phenomenon. And I think it's something all racing jurisdictions can learn from. Um, what happened to the case in your jurisdiction may be useful to understand what happened the case in mine. Um, but we do need to understand that people are operating within quite different legal systems. Um, it's interesting to note the distinction, for example, between whether racing is governed by public law or private law. Um, in Ireland, it's kind of in between, um, which I won't bore you with. But we are here in France, where public law is dealt with ultimately in the section contentieux of the Conseil d'État. Private law is dealt with in the Cour de Cassation. In common law countries, it's typical that there's a single top Supreme Court. So, and the legal systems within which those courts operate can be quite different. So it isn't necessary that everything is the same, but at the same time, where cases are brought successfully in one jurisdiction, or indeed are successfully seen off in another jurisdiction, there can be learnings for everyone. And perhaps a greater level of sharing of knowledge about the cases that are being brought and the results of those cases would be extremely useful. Um, as I indicated in an earlier context, uh, being able to see off the next case before it starts is a great advantage over having the embarrassment of having lost you being the test case and your jurisdiction being the test case in, in which a new point was, um, was found to be valid and decisions of racing authorities overturned. Where the stakes are high, people will spend money to try and procure an appropriate result. Whether the stakes are high in the sense of prize money or breeding value, or whether the stakes are high in terms of illicit betting activity, once the stakes are high, people will be prepared to expend money attempting uh, to uh, secure a particular result. Um, I recall uh, chairing a, a, an appeal panel on, on a purely refereeing decision about whether a, a, a race result should have been overturned by the local stewards uh, to find that one of the horses was represented by a QC from London who had been brought over to Ireland at great expense and the other horse who was owned by a well-known Irish breeding and training operation which I won't name was represented by a very distinguished then member of the Irish Bar who ultimately turned out to be my successor as Chief Justice of Ireland. So they were prepared to put their, their money where their mouths were. We upheld the decision of the local stewards which was that the Irish horse won. I went back to our courts building and was criticised by my colleagues for saying you came up with a hometown decision for the Irish horse over the English horse and I said we did no such thing. We came up with a hometown decision for the Irish Senior Council over the English Queen's Council. <laughs> uh, that was of course a lie, the case was entirely objectively considered on the merits. <laughs> but, but a good joke none, nonetheless gets you a, 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 some distance. Uh, can I finish by saying that um, it's perhaps being unduly revelatory of my advancing years to say that I have been going to horse races and have been a fan of horse racing for just short of 70 years. Um, I would like for whatever number of additional years are left to me to be able to enjoy going to horse racing in a way in which I am attending a sport which by and large most people think is straight, by and large most people think uh, is run fairly. And I think a great danger for us all, uh, which is echoed in quite a number of the strategic uh, areas identified by this body, uh, is that if you lose that sort of center ground of public opinion, many of those things change. Uh, who wants to be an owner and spend a lot of money owning racehorses if it's not regarded as a respectable activity? I very much agree with the statement of the chair that we need to promote racing more as a sport and less as purely a gambling activity because I think that has a resonance with a much wider number of people while recognizing of course that a lot of the funding of racing does come from gambling. But the new generation of people who may be attracted to the sport will not be attracted if they regard it as not being a respectable activity.
So integrity, I think, is integral to everything we do. The future of the sport, the ability for it at least to last my lifetime, is vitally dependent on that centre ground of the public remaining supportive of racing as something, even if they don't particularly have an interest in, that they regard as a perfectly respectable thing for other people to spend their time and money and emotions on. And long may it last, and thank you very much for listening.